안녕하세요 궁금한뇌 여러분 오늘은 저희 개인적인 히어로인 세계적인 뇌과학자 데이비드 이글먼 교수님과 함께 하게 됐습니다 제가 정말 박사과정도 이 교수님 밑에서 하고 싶어 할 만큼 정말 예전부터 좋아하던 교수님인데요 교수님의 캘리포니아 집에서 이렇게 직접 궁금한뇌 촬영을 하게 돼서 정말 기쁩니다 It's a great pleasure David I mean you're my personal hero, I mean, in terms of science communication, in neuroscience, and all these crazy innovative ideas you put into action, it really inspired me since I was a really young student. Thank and you. it's a great pleasure to really be with you and uh, interview you here. It's a pleasure to meet you and get to spend time with you. Yeah. Uh, and we are going to talk about your new book. Yeah. You have written it 2020, but in Korea it just came out this year great. about the book Live Wired. Okay. Um, I mean, you have written many books on time, on, on incognito, on the brain, on death, but Live Wired, that's a really nice name. Could you explain what you meant with Live Wired? Yeah, so my interest is in brain plasticity, which means the brain's ability to rewire itself and always adjust and change itself. And we think, you know, we're here in Silicon Valley right now, and everything is about hardware and software you make trim and efficient hardware layer and trim and efficient software but what's happening in the brain is nothing like that it's not like hardware and software instead it's what i call liveware and the idea is that it's you know every moment of your life your tens of billions of neurons are seeking and making connections and changing the strength of those connections but also unplugging and replugging and you having been at my house for five minutes now, your brain is different, right? You know the architecture, you know where we are, there's things that you know maybe you'll remember for the rest of your life, and that's because of changes in your brain that have occurred across these vast seas of billions of brain cells, neurons, and, um, and that's what plasticity is about. We used to use the word plasticity. I prefer the word uh, live-wired because plasticity was coined by the American neuroscientist William James because he was impressed by plastic manufacturing. You take something, you mold it into shape, and it holds on to that shape. But what we know now about the size of what's happening requires a new level of thinking about this. If you have 500 trillion connections that are constantly dynamically changing all the time, we need a better word than just plastic. The class that I'm teaching right now at Stanford is called Literature and the Brain. That's where I just came from moments ago. Okay. And I'm always asking this question about what is it when we watch a movie or we read a book, what is different in the brain? And there is something different because when you see an explosion in the movie, you don't actually duck for cover. So some part of your brain knows. And yet you'll sit in the movie and you'll cry and you'll laugh and so on. So we are very invested in the story, but part of our brain knows that we are separate. Yeah. And uh, live wired, I mean, this is a very actual team these days because it also implies the brain can rewire itself. Yes. And uh, that's part of live wired. Exactly. And that's exactly what artificial intelligence, AI, can't do yet, I'd say. Uh, really rewiring itself, knowing who I am, and being able to reflect and uh, having these metacognitive abilities? Right. AI, as it's commonly done now, is with convolutional neural networks, deep learning. And in a sense, it is plasticity in the sense that you're feeding it billions of images and it's changing the connection strengths. But of course, you're right that that's where the similarity ends. Because the idea is that as neuroscience discovery has moved along, people have realized, hey, there are interesting things happening in the brain. Maybe we can build AI out of that. And so people building AI, AI have said, hey, let's look at units that are connected and the strength of the connection can change. And what that has led to is obviously all kinds of wonderful right. things in AI. But it's like a cartoon of the brain, and it's not actually doing the same things. So while we can do amazing things with it, you're exactly right. At least as it stands now, it doesn't have things like metacognition or presumably consciousness. Our current AI fails catastrophically when you train it, let's say, to distinguish pictures of cats and dogs, and then you show it a picture of a camel or something. It doesn't, you know, or you ask it to do a different kind of task, it fails. 
you can take a you know five year old kid and say, here's a brand new thing that you've never done before. It has the child has no problem learning that. And kids, of course, by the time they're three years old, can navigate a complex room and socially manipulate adults and get food and eat it and whatever. All these things that we have a very difficult time teaching AI right. to do. Currently. Because uh, it mainly the artificial intelligence algorithms these days are based on the very basic bottom-up uh, level of the brain, and it doesn't simulate the other yeah. part yet. Yeah, that's so, exactly right. So um, the AI algorithms need so much data, large language yes. models, whereas kids don't need that much data to learn. So it's probably also a difference which goes in the category of being live-wired to the human brain? Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, I think the AI is live-wired in the sense that it's changing its parameters, but Yes, with a kid you've got much uh, less data and there's of course one shot learning where you tell a child, hey, this is called a pomegranate and the child says, okay, got it, it's called a pomegranate. Whereas it's very difficult with AI to teach it something in one shot. Right, so yeah. AI is also going towards the live wired uh, brain intelligence, but in a very different sense. Yeah, and I think it'll just take a long time to get there because we still, as you well know, we still have so many mysteries to uncover about the way that the brain is actually doing stuff because mother nature has had four billion years to try out trillions of experiments in parallel and eventually came out with this but we've just been doing AI work for the last several decades as we learn more of mother nature's tricks I'm sure we'll take those over to AI and implement those there was an interesting part in your book chapter 10 uh, when we talked about uh, mod memory, memory mod. So if you get too much information, not in the human brain, yeah. but uh, in algorithms, I mean, it gets difficult to get the information out. Yeah. Will that not happen with the human brain? I mean, we are getting more and more information, and I have the feeling that now we actually outsource a lot of information to the internet, to the databases, and probably we will do it with AI. Yeah. Do you think that kind of overflow of information will not affect humans uh, in a negative way? When the printing press was first introduced in 1440, the concern that people had was, well, if everything's written down in books, why would you memorize a great poem or something? You can just look it up. So the question is, is it negative that we don't memorize epic poems anymore, but instead we just go look it up? I don't think it's negative, it's just a change in what we do. In your chapter nine, you're kind of touching on the aging brain. Some people are saying we will live 200 years and we can slow down aging. But I see one puzzling fact here, and that is that actually the way we perceive time or information changes with age. We are living longer and more longer and longer. The brain development of uh, how to take information doesn't change. So isn't that going to become difficult when from the outside you don't know what actually, how much information the brain gets, but the way the brain deals with information differs from generation to generation? One is that because the brain is locked in darkness, its job is to make an internal model of what's going on in the world. But the key is that it's trying to get its internal model as best it can and the way it does that is by surprise when something when it sees something that it didn't expect and it says oh that's weird I, I need to change that and that's how it keeps improving its internal model or with action by actively exploring and changing yeah, the world qu right? quite right but only if that action is yielding surprise so if I do an action and everything happens exactly the way I expected it to I don't make any changes and so the key is as people get older their internal models tend to be better and better, and as a result, their brains aren't making much change. So they're less surprised. They're less surprised, exactly. So what happens for a young person, they get to the end of a summer, and they feel, wow, that summer lasted forever because they've had so much memory that their brain wrote down. But for an older person, because they sort of know how the world works, they don't write down much memory. And as a result, when they look back at the end of the summer, they say, well, what happened? Well, I can't really remember anything. I guess the summer was here and went. If we come to live 200 years, which by the way, I don't know that I think we're going to, but <laughs> if we did, unfortunately we still have this problem that time will speed up as we get older.
Right now, it sounds a bit like science fiction. People are working on ways to get electrodes and more electrodes into the brain. Not being able to distinguish real from virtual. We don't have any evidence that we're not in a simulation. <laughs> I, I hope people will learn from it.